Intellectual and Manual Labor, a Critique of Epistemology by Alfred Sonmethel. This is chapter 34 to 36. So, chapter 34. The Curse of the Second Nature. With the achievement of automation, the postulate of the automatis automatism, which we described in part two of this book, has reached its final stage. In automation, the second nature reigns supreme, ruled as it is by the logic of appropriation. The second nature cannot enrich itself out of any other source than real nature, and labor is the channel through which it does so. Capital grew fat and mighty by sucking the surplus out of labor. Can it continue to grow fat out of its own products? Capital faces the ultimate contradiction. The labor process has to function for capital as automatism to enable capital to exploit labor. But now the um, automatism alone remains and labor is discarded. Obviously, labor is fully discarded only in the rarest of cases. As a rule, automation only covers part processes. And although its scope and its range are increasing in the great mass of industries, the global size of the human workforce still grows both in the advanced and in the developing countries, even with unemployment forcing or forming stagnant pools. An automated labor process is still a labor process, but a labor process of a completely social scope, social in the terms of a science and a technology resting on the logic of appropriation peculiar to commodity value. The subjectivity of the individual labor power, the mental, sensorial, and nervous functions of an individual while at work has been replaced by the electronics of automation. Technological devices in substituting for the worker's personal attributes emancipate the subjectivity of labor from the organic limitations of the individual and transform it into a social power of machinery. Thus, the electronics of an automated labor process act not for the subjectivity of one worker only, but for all the workers employed in its previous manual stage. Automation amounts to the socialization of the human labor power, which, in certain aspects, it surpasses in its scope of capability, range of action, its speed, reliability, and precision, though only in a restricted and its set specialization. As Marx traces the evolution of the capitalist mode of production throughout its history, he never fails to point to its emancipating effect as well as its evils. Even prior to the employment of machinery in the period of manufacture, when the work cooperates in a planned way with others, he strips off the fetters of his individuality and develops the capabilities of his species. Then when the machine enters the picture, the number of tools that a machine tool can bring into play simultaneously is from the outset independent of the organic limitations that confine the tools of the handicraftsman. Similarly, as to the gain in power. As soon as tools had been converted from being manual implements of a man into the parts of a machine, the motive mechanism also acquired an independent form, entirely emancipated from the restraints of human strength. Taking into consideration the factory as a whole, along with the tool, the skill of the worker in handing it passes over to the machine in handling it passes over to the machine. The capabilities of the tool are emancipated from the restraints inseparable from human labor power. Many other indications of this aspect of the capitalist development could be gathered from Marx's writings. The talk of emancipation should, of course, not evoke illusions. It is not the worker who could ever reap emancip emancipatory benefits under capitalism. The worker is not freed from labor by the machine, but his labor is emptied of its content, as Marx remarks. It is capital that is emancipated from certain barriers which hitherto set limits to the range of the exploitation of labor. As long as science and technology serve the development of the means of production of capital, their advance can, be, can but be for the enhancement of profits at the expense of the workers. All means for the development of production undergo a dialectical inversion so that they become means of domination and exploitation of the producers. Nevertheless, to associate this process with the term emancipation 
carries an important pointer for the working class. The achievement of socialism does not necessitate scrapping the means of capitalist production to replace them by socialist means. To recognize with Marx the potentialities of emancipation in the capitalist machinery means, however much this machinery incorporates the rule of capital over labor, it can be transformed into means of production for socialism once the revolutionary power of the working class has broken the power of capital. Each step of emancipation is due to the directly social capacity of capital, to its nature as social power in private hands. Automation, however, marks a step of emancipation more significant and far-reaching than any before. Here the worker has not only his work alleviated, he is dismissed from the work himself. Automation, seen by itself, is a creation by the powers of appropriation, those of capital and those of the intellect. This creation must be put into a new relationship with man, just as man needs a new relationship to the automating machinery. We thus have the result that now man would, in principle, have at his disposal production forces, which in themselves embrace in their physical reality the socialization which in the ages of commodity production has grown up in the intellectual work of the human mind, that is, in science. This is a reversal in the relationship between man and his tool. The tools are the repositories of his social potentialities, and man can remain an individual using these tools to satisfy his needs and wishes with as yet unforeseeable horizons. It is clear that this assumes socialism in the place of capitalism. It must, however, be remarked that abolition of private capital by the abrogation of its property rights does not automatically dispose of the antithesis of intellectual and manual labor. If this antithesis remains in being, it makes for the continuation of an antagonistic society. Only conscious political action by the revolutionary forces can overcome this obstacle to socialism and make the direct producers the power that masters handles and develops the means of production. Otherwise, the development and disposal of the forces of social production remain the privilege of scientists and technologists, of experts and specialists, who, enmeshed with a vast bureaucracy of administrators, carry on a reign of technocracy. This marks the chief dividing line between the People's Republic of China and Soviet Russia as the main protagonists of socialism in the world today. The Russians justify their regime as a socialist one on the ground that it guarantees the speediest way to automation. But even this is contended by China, where it is argued that the workers must build the automation themselves to suit their own purposes. The interest of capital to maintain the gap between the advanced and opulent countries and the developing and poverty stricken is as deep and as permanent as ever, and it will keep a world in being in which that which is possible is hidden by that which is existing. Capital will exert any means at its command to maintain the rule of a logic of appropriation and prevent a rule of the logic of production from restoring man's proper relation to nature on earth. And yet it is the very dialectic of capitalism which creates the conditions for a society of production to arise. Chapter 35, The Epoch of Transition. As Marxists, we were brought up to think that all the contradictions inherent in capitalism, the one between the ever-increasing social dimension of production and private appropriation, is the most fundamental. It expresses the historical trend of the capitalist mode of production and asserts its transient character. This teaching has gained enhanced relevance in monopoly capitalism. With the introduction of flow production, the social dimension assumed a specific structural form of its own and henceforth increased in a conclusive manner, reaching in our days the size of the giant multinational corporations. This provides convincing evidence of the importance of the new commensuration of labor in making the development of production and the development of the markets proceed at variance. Their discrepancy creates problems which tend to exceed the controlling power of private capital and demands supplementation by the social resources and power of the state. The epoch in which we live is the epoch of transition, which must either lead to socialism or to social disaster. Science and technology have developed to new forms. 
But while classical physics is securely based on its mathematical and experimental method, the relativity theory and quantum physics have thrown science into methodological uncertainty. Classical physics, in its unchallenged reign, shared the lifespan of modern capitalism up to the end of its classical free market period. Although now relegated to second place, it still has an important role to play and remains an adequate scientific method for a great mass of the technological tasks in the present world, not excluding, not excluding the socialist parts. Were we then entitled to speak of classical science as bourgeois science as we did in chapter 20? Let us be quite clear. Methodologically, classical physics has nothing to do with the exploitation of labor by capital. Its findings are valid irrespective of any particular production relations. Inasmuch as it is based on the mathematical and experimental method, science is one and only one, and one only. Exact science carries objectivity because the elements of the exchange abstraction, which in themselves are entirely of the second nature, have substantial identity with the corresponding elements of real nature, owing to the fact that the separation of exchange from use, and hence the creation of the exchange abstraction itself, happens as an event in time and space in every occurrence of exchange. On the other hand, looking at nature under the categories of the commodity form, science affords precisely the technology on which hinges the controlling power of capital over production. It cuts up nature piecemeal by isolating its objects of study from the context in which they occur, ignoring nature and its importance as the habitat of society. The environmental conditions are treated as a mass of interfering circumstances, which must at all costs be kept out of the experiments. In this way, the phenomena are, are severed from the human world and cut down to recurrent events. These are defined by mathematical equations signifying the description of immutable laws of nature, providing the automatism demanded by capital. True, this deterministic and orthodox concept of natural law has in more recent times been increasingly supplemented by statistical laws and therewith strict necessity by probability. However, the pattern of exact science is still fundamentally that of classical physics. It is a pattern of science closely connected with the division of intellectual and manual labor. In fact, it forms the hard core of this division since the intellect is the very creation of the exchange abstraction, circulating as money and again as capital. The practice of science in the service of capital pays allegiance to an idea of the intellect, which is a fetish concept of the human mind, seen as the spontaneous source of the non-empirical concepts basic to science. In the framework of this fetishism, the science of the mathematical and experimental method is indeed bourgeois science, the scientists pursuing their vital social tasks while being steeped in false consciousness about their function and the nature of science itself. Our attempt to retrace the intellectual powers of conceptual reasoning to the real historical roots in the social systems of commodity production serves the critical liquidation of this fetishism and its epistemological doctrine. Chapter 26, or sorry, chapter 36, Logic of Appropriation and Logic of Production. The basic difference of socialism from capitalism, as seen from our viewpoint, is in the relationship of society to nature. Whereas in capitalism, the existing technology serves as machinery for the exploitation of one class of society by another, in socialism, it must be made the instrument of the relationship of society to nature. If present advanced technology does not allow for such a change, then it must be transformed and freed from the adverse elements and the power structure ingrained in it. To speak with Ernst Bloch, the science and technology of our age rule over nature like an occupying army in enemy country, whereas in socialism we must aim to establish an alliance of society with nature. This cannot be done by dispensing with science, but demands the aid of a science backed by the unity of mental and manual work. Contemporary history offers examples which can be drawn upon to illustrate some features of this fundamental change. 
It cannot be our intention here to give more than the barest hints of the tenants, the tenants involved. A detailed examination must be reserved for a separate study. The examples I choose are three. One, the remarkable enterprise of the Tennessee Valley Authority, TVA, in the USA. Two, a special aspect of the development of socialism in the People's Republic of China. And three, a, neg a negative lesson to be derived from Stalin's plan for the re remaking of nature of 1948. Of the work of the TVA, David E. Lilenthal is its first chairman, has given an inspiring report covering the first decade under the significant subtitle, Democracy on the March. His book is a mine of information deserving scrutiny by present day students for the positive and the negative features of the project as seen from a socialist viewpoint. The TVA was created in April 1933 at the crest of the wave of Roosevelt's New Deal, the nearest the USA has ever been to a social revolution. The catchment basin of the Tennessee River, an area almost the size of England and Scotland combined, utterly eroded and devastated by capitalist exploitation, was, like a patient revived from the brink of death, restored to health and prosperity. Waters once wasted and destructive were controlled for irrigation, electricity, transport, fishing, and pleasure. Planned conservation of the soil recreated the fertility of the land. Agriculture, industry, forestry, mining, village, and town communities flourished. This was a task of combined action upon a region in its entirety, which cannot be performed by the isolating strategy of bourgeois science in the service of capital. The fundamental aspects of the project are formulated by Lilenthal Wright at the beginning of his report as the two governing tenets of the enterprise. First, that resource development must be governed by the unity of nature itself. Second, that the people must participate actively in that development. But if, in the doing, the unity of nature's resources is disregarded, the price will be paid in exhausted land, butchered forests, polluted streams, and industrial ugliness. And if the people are denied an active part in this, in this great task, then they may be poor or they may be prosperous, but they will not be free. We would say they would be the slaves of capitalist exploitation. Our second example, Revolutionary China, of course offers inexhaustible illustrations of society coping with nature as the human habitat and on the basis of socialist democracy. The instance I choose accentuates the unification of mental and manual labor. Jack Westaby, a former forestry specialist of the International Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, surveys the progress of a forestation made in China since 1949 after two millennia of forest depletion. He heads his article, Whose Trees?, and analyzes the problems involved, embracing not merely the planting of trees but the entire ecology, from the viewpoint, to whom does science belong? The necessity is not to alter the methodological constitution of science to change its character from a bourgeois to a socialist one, but the need is for the daily revolution, which is making science everybody's business. This is the most important aspect of the evolution of Chinese science. Why have plantings since the mid-60s been very much more effective than the ones preceding? The heart of the answer has to do with the cultural revolution, with the struggle of the masses making science their property. It radiated the available expertise into the countryside, making the special knowledge of forestry science more directly the property of the masses and it encouraged and helped the peasants to analyze their own experience to become forestry scientists themselves. New forests are created by the people, not by professional foresters. Here, in accordance with the teaching of Mao Zedong, science is not discarded. It is, on the contrary, utilized in all its specialized and isolating practices, but in a socialist framework and integrated into the context of nature as the human habitat. The use and significance of science changes in this process of transfer to the direct producers. However, it is not a change resulting from a prior decision about the class nature of science, but from the effects of the socialist practice it is made to serve. In Stalin's famous or notorious plan for the remaking of nature, 
science and the special science of biology and plant breeding was discarded because the isolating method of genetical selection was judged to be bourgeois in essence and incompatible with the alleged Marxian truth of dialectical materialism. Here, a science is discarded, not in the light of new research of superior scientific validity, but simply on the strength of a philosophical belief in dialectical materialism regarded as an a priori truth. It is well known that the substitute for the orthodox biological science was provided by T.D. Lysenko, and that with Stalin's connivance, all the geneticists opposing Lysenko were ousted from the Lenin Academy of Agricultural Science of the USSR in the session of July to August 1948. The course of action advocated by Lysenko and adopted by Stalin and the party proved bogus and condemned the much-boosted plan to failure, entailing considerable damage to Russian agriculture. Here, a project had been conceived for tackling nature as a whole, like the project of the TVA, though on a vastly more grandiose scale and by a government professing to be socialist. But while the TVA made the greatest possible use of science and advanced technology, Stalin relied on the doctrine of, ref of reflection and the associated materialist metaphysics. There was emphasis on basic democracy in the execution of the plan, but the masses did not benefit and the attempt at breaching the division of intellectual and manual labor remained unavailing. What emerges from these examples is, first, that the science indispensable for socialism is methodologically the same as the science in capitalism. Second, that socialism has the means to counteract the properties which, in capitalism, constitute the bourgeois character of the science. These properties are that the basic categories of science are of the second nature, and totally alienated from the qualitative realities of the first nature. That science is compelled to single out its objects as isolates, and that it must be carried out as an intellectual exploit. All these properties are capable of remedy by the feature, the essential one of socialism, that the people as direct producers must be the controlling masters of both the material and intellectual means of production, and that they act in concert to establish their prosperity within nature and its global unity. For this feature signifies that the material practice of the people in their social exploits commands the need for scientific findings to be integrated into the relationship of society to nature. In the service of capital, the findings of science are each of them items in commodity form presented to capital for its exploitation. This position does not alter when a number of such findings are combined to be exploited in their association. Whereas in the practice of a socialist project, as evidenced also by the work of the TVA, the findings of science never remain single, but are always combined under the logic of production, regulating any collective interaction with nature. The difference then between the status of science in capitalism and in socialism is not in that the logic of science will change from a logic of appropriation to one of production. It is rather that the relationship between them differs. In capitalism, the logic of appropriation reigning in the economics of profit making and in science dominates the logic of production in the manual activities of the wage laborers. Whereas in socialism, the relationship is the opposite. That the logic of production animating any socialist project dominates the logic of appropriation of a science belonging to the producers. It cannot, of course, be ruled out that in the long run, the logic and method of science will alter as a result of socialist developments. But what is certain to change is the technology taken over from capitalism, and this change will not only be the one, be one of the machinery itself, but also a change in the manner of producing it. Its construction will increasingly become the work of the direct producers rather than that of professional experts. We can see many examples of this change in China, particularly since the Cultural Revolution. Given a new qualitatively different technology, a new theoretical conception of its mode of working may emerge deepening its understanding and giving it the universality needed for its general social utilization. Our considerations in this chapter are based on the assumption of future socialism, transforming the giant social dimensions of present capitalist corporations to collective projects by the people as masters of their destiny. 
It is not our place here to predict how socialism is to come about in the advanced parts of the world. It is certain, however, that a change of the social system can no longer be spearheaded by an armed uprising of the workers as in the past, since the distribution of armed power is one-sided beyond dispute. On the other hand, what the ruling class is piling up in material arms, it is losing morally by its mounting disrepute. It fails increasingly to serve society by providing gainful employment for the people and actively endangers their life by the technological perversions in military and industrial use. Therefore, it ought to be only a question of time until the workers can defeat the ruling system, armed with the political support and the ideological backing of the overwhelming mass of the people. The purpose of a study like the present must be seen against such a background. Meh.